This is another video about sacred morality. And the reason why I go over this and my martial arts challenge from different angles, I explore it more and more, is not only to overkill my point, but because it is key for me to establish, for me to secure a future for sacred morality in the minds, hearts, and souls of men and women and children. And I must secure my rightful place to do so and explain to people why I do sparring and not fighting, which goes back to morality and honor and the relevance of these things. And I've done a very great job doing just that. Before we get into morality, let's talk about the types of conformists who help with eugenics. These people are helping something that is satanic and they're helping the worst criminals. Let's just briefly explore this. So when we look at who's the most concerned with reduction in poverty, crime, sexual immorality or licentiousness, political dissent, etc., you know, and um, mental retardation, right? Who's the most concerned with these things on sociological levels? For example, when it comes to poverty, the average poor person is absolutely concerned with being poor, but they don't want to reduce poverty by any means necessary, including sterilizing themselves. You see what I mean? So just briefly, when, when it comes to poverty, social workers, rich people, police officers, because poverty and crime tend to go hand in hand. Business owners as well, for the same reason. These are the same sorts of people who are concerned with crime. Rich people, law enforcement, business owners, medical staff, because they see victims of gunshot wounds and assaults and rapes come through and so on. <clears throat> Sexual immorality and licentiousness. Rich people, humanists, medical staff, because they're placed at risk in clinics and hospitals when they deal with people with STDs and open wounds and whatnot, even if they wear proper protective equipment such as latex gloves, etc. And that's just part of it. The other part of it is they see the great number of these people and it, it alarms them. Now, rich people, they like to sleep around. They don't want to have to worry about sleeping with people with STDs. So, you know, when they're taking advantage of their secretaries or they're using their money to woe an attractive, less than rich woman, especially, they want to see a, a major reduction in STDs. It's obvious why they're concerned with crime and poverty. They think there's too many poor people on the road and at the store and they don't want to, have to deal with them. And they think that they're more deserving of life than the poor. Again, this is just brief. Let me wrap up this intro. Political dissonance. Rich people are concerned because... If they're uncontrolled, they're making rich people look bad, and they're doing things in a way that they don't approve of. Law enforcement, <clears throat> they have to deal with them, you know, like they put these um, Native American guys in dog kennels. I think it was Standing Rock or something like that, the protests they were having. <clears throat> Social controllers, absolutely. The military, um, they're, they're the people who have experimented on political dissidents. They're experimenting on me right now. <clears throat> they're, they're, they will be called in, the National Guard, to deal with political dissidents domestically and abroad. They're called in to deal with them abroad. So they don't want to see this kind of global movement or any political dissidents at all, and certainly not any global collaboration of uncontrolled political dissenters. Educational staff. Again, education is used. And I'll put the pr appropriate Mimi you know, on the screen. It is used to dumb people down and kill originality 
to make them part of the workforce and not to challenge the elite and the privileged families who have, it's kind of like an auditorium <clears throat> where the seats that belong to the most successful people are reserved. You know, those positions are reserved for the rich and whatever intellectual people they meet at Ivy League schools that they grow fond of. Teachers, um, for the same reason, you know, principals, heads of departments, you know, and so on, uh, at, at colleges and schools. Controlled political groups, etc. Well, I'll end it there. This is going to be a long video. Bear with me. It's a good one. Every person on this planet is more than just kind of capable of being extremely irritated, agitated, and aggressive. Achieving a state of mind where the fight or flight reaction has been initiated and they don't care about anything else. All animals, especially humans, have a part of their brain where all that matters is fight or flight. This is a positive evolutionary trait in a natural environment. Because if you are not focused on the fight or the flight, and you're distracted, you will have reduced the likelihood that you will live through such an encounter. In order for one to overcome adversity and pain when attacked by a predator or when attacking one's prey, one must have certain genetic and biological traits that allow them to do so effectively and with focus. This focus is what martial arts cultivates and refines within the practitioner. What they are doing to me is very simple, very straightforward. They are using substances, chemicals, perhaps frequencies and possibly they could use electricity one day don't know you know perhaps energy weapons I don't know I I have no strong evidence of that in my case but certainly there's the substances and the chemicals the drugs rather and what it does is there's a period of agitation even though I'm sedated. So I feel kind of clumsy and tired, but irritated. You ever, you've ever felt tired and irritated and grumpy? You know, you're like, I'm tired, leave me alone. Imagine two lovers in bed, right? And the woman is telling the man, look, no, I don't wanna have sex. You know, I'm tired, you know, and so on. You know, she's agitated, she's like, uh, you know? And he's frustrated, like, damn it. It's kind of how I feel a lot where I'm irritated and I want to lash out, but it's very hard for me to overcome the drugs and focus. So they're tapping into the part of the brain that is associated with the fight or flight reaction more than other parts. However, they're also sedating me. So you get this kind of nothing else matters but my irritation and it's hard not to think about being irritated and agitated. However, I can't use it effectively with, you know, without a great ability to transcend and focus. It's quite an interesting situation because my fight or flight reaction and my focus is being tapped into using my martial arts techniques, most of which I have developed myself. However, the adversity that I'm facing isn't in the form of an animal or extreme weather or something. It is in the form of the drugging. So how it plays out, you know, is that I, I have great difficulty doing my martial arts and I can't truly feel like myself. 
The problem with the idea of tapping into one part of the brain without sedatives, which may be a military application of some of the technologies they use here, is that you do not feel completely naturally like yourself. Too much stimulation is unnatural. There is a balance in battle where you are aware and you are thinking and you're thinking fast. As Ali said, I outwit them and then I outhit them. If you are only out hitting them and not outwitting them, you create the opportunity for a more effective fighter to strike and deliver those deadly blows. And you might continue to fight with them and then all of a sudden you drop because you're all adrenaline and all fight or flight and not enough wit. I've said it many times, martial arts are things for the most perceptive of people. I don't think you can find someone more perceptive than a great martial artist. And the amount of brain power you need it's not just perception, but it is quick calculations. Not necessarily mathematical, because you're not using, you know, algebra or, you know, geometry per se. I mean, in a way you are using geometry. You might even call it sacred geometry. But it's really a different kind of calculation. Distance, speed, time, you know, techniques, technique-related calculations and so on. So, of the most perceptive people in society, perhaps martial artists, the great ones, are some of the more perceptive, perhaps even the most. And perception and insight are, in my opinion, the most important forms of intelligence because these are the things that eccentric people throughout history have used to invent things, to solve difficult problems that other people couldn't figure out, and to triumph in battle. So it's very interesting when you see these people, right? These sapeo sexuals, for example. And they say, you know, we value, you know, intellect turns us on. Intelligence. Well, the intelligence, the natural intelligence that a great martial artist cultivates becomes intellect in its highest form, perhaps. Especially when one considers that wisdom derived from morality, you know, tempered with morality, um, as the outcome of a higher sense of virtue is the highest form of intellect and intelligence. This is something you're not born with, something you gain from experience and applying wisdom. It's one thing to, or rather, applying morality, which is a form of applying wisdom. It's one thing to go through life and to learn the tricks of the trade, the ins and outs, you know, how to get money more effectively. Even, you know, learning how to program more effectively, or medical sciences, understanding them better as a result of experience. But it is such a, it is a much more magnificent and powerful level of wisdom or form of wisdom to go through life with sacred morality and understanding life through the lens of someone who adheres to sacred morality. That is the highest form of wisdom and intellect, since intellect is a result of years of intelligence. So the most intellectual people are people such as actual, you know, pastors who, are, who aren't in secret societies, um, great martial artists who adhere to sacred morality because their system is traditional. It is sacred. These are sacred traditions associated with cultures, tribes, and nations, and peoples. So their morality, too, is sacred. 
And as the martial artist develops and grows and ages, he is looking at the world through the lens of sacred morality and he's refining one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, forms of intelligence. It is as if he is initiated or introduced to the most complex science when he is younger, if he starts when he's younger. And he studies it and learns from it and experiences it his entire life after that. For this reason, it is insane for any woman who calls herself a sapeo sexual to not first and foremost value the top martial artist. And no, I am not just saying this because it is me. It has become painfully apparent because it is me. Sacred morality, the highest form of wisdom and intellect. This also gives the martial artist who is a Christian or a Muslim or some religion with a powerful system and set of morals the upper hand over the peaceful religious man. Why, you might ask? Because he's refining his perceptive abilities in a way that is stimulating the brain intensely. He's not just kind of sitting back lazy saying, hey, look at that, that's kind of cool, his whole life. He is powerfully analyzing his whole life. His brain is powered it's like comparing a bicycle to a Ferrari. You know, his brain is more powered. And the extra horsepower has been added on over the years. This is how it is. Now, I'm not saying I'm the smartest person in history. I don't believe that. I believe that I'm up there with the great minds in this country. I do believe that. I don't believe that I am the most perceptive person or the smartest, but I do believe I am up there. And the main reason I say this isn't the IQ test. It isn't me doing complex math equations as a child. It is because of my adherence to morality in a very definitive way. When you see someone who is making insightful arguments while adhering to the deepest levels of morality, the most profound parts of morality. That person must be among the most wise people in a nation if there is an appalling absence of people such as him in that nation. In other words, you know them by their works. So when you look at sparring as the top form of martial arts competition, among the transferable skills it shows is intelligence and wisdom. If you have a match between masters or great martial artists. There are many martial artists who understand the technique, the techniques, the various techniques, and they'll throw a lot of flashy kicks during the match. They'll have a lot of very effective moves, and they're displaying a certain intelligence and a certain skill. But when you look at men such as myself or Bruce Lee during sparring, you see a higher intelligence and focus. Bruce Lee didn't throw a bunch of flashy kicks during sparring. He sparred in a way very similar to myself. It was, you saw the calculation. It wasn't just trying to get someone to slip up as a result of throwing a bunch of hard to predict moves or strategic moves. 
it was calculating and reading the enemy intensely and then striking. In my case, when you look carefully, you see that. On the first match, you see that and you see that there's honor, that I don't want to continue throwing blows after I've after I struck him already. You know, look at it very carefully. You know, I'm on drugs, I'm fumed, I was hungry in the morning, and I managed a very respectable level of application. In the second match, I was fumed far worse than the first. It was so bad that on the way there, I made a video saying I might have to cancel the match because I'm so intensely fumed. I got there, I was extremely lightheaded. I was slowed way down as if I had huge lead blocks on my feet and arms. But you see this calculation where first I'm testing to see where his head's at. And then the calculation comes in. Every blow that I intended to land, landed. Every blow I intended to, you know, change his guard or create the situation for me to land a blow, did just that. There was a higher calculation and wisdom in my application. And so it is with fighting with weapons. That sort of application becomes key. A miscalculation can cost you your life in a blink in the blink of an eye. That, my friends, is probably the most important transferable skill. And it directly relates to maneuverability. Your maneuverability is based on your intelligence, right? Your ability to outmaneuver them, you're outwitting them. And then you're outstriking them, even if they strike harder. Because you're striking more effective and what Bruce Lee called direct. He said the best application of martial arts is direct. What's more direct than smashing someone's spine, gouging out their eye, or smashing their genitals, smashing their ribs, effectively palm striking their solar plexus, smashing their throat, their trachea or larynx. Targeting the kidney, the liver, or other internal organs, the heart, the brain. It's very direct and to the point. That is what martial arts is. It is not being a big brute, using brute force. That is not martial arts. If there is no intelligence, there is no art. The art isn't just being graceful. That is secondary at best. The art is the art of using your brain power to outwit, outmaneuver, and outperform the enemy and to be more direct. For example, say the enemy is swinging really wide because he wants to swing, to say cut your head off or slice your stomach. He swings wide or he swings wide in angle and you go in right quickly and you stab him right in the throat. And then you block that wide swing. You were more direct and to the point. He might have been three times your size. That's what martial arts is. Intelligence, maneuverability, agility, technique, timing, directness, transferable skills, and communicating those skills, communicable skills. He said, I just communicated to you that I am more direct and effective. And that's the last thing you saw. And the guy behind you or next to you was like, oh shit, that motherfucker isn't playing. That motherfucker is going to kill me if I try to come at him. As Bruce Lee has said, these are combat skills. And when it comes down to it, it does help to train every part of your body. But it's not necessary as long as you are direct and effective.
So when you look at something like UFC fighting, right, it is designed for brute force. They're wearing gloves. I mean, show me one example of a, a deadly blow in UFC fighting. If you remove deadly blows, it's not really martial arts combat. It is a sport. It's entertaining. I like it myself. But that's not true martial arts. You've removed the element of intense intelligence. There's still a certain intellect and intelligence required in UFC fighting, but it's not the same as in sparring, where it is the brute force element is removed. You're focusing completely on the foundation and the essence of martial arts. And the argument that, oh, what, sparring is stupid shows a lack of intellect. You can't even understand that this is a match of wits. That's like saying chess is stupid. You're just moving pieces on the board. What's the point? Because it is about intelligence, intellect, mental prowess. And when you say, well, it doesn't show who hits harder or, you, you know, you don't have to have a good form. Nonsense. Martial arts techniques, the main purpose of them is to outmaneuver the opponent and strike them first. The stances, it, before there was unarmed combat, in a very deadly way, there was armed combat. That's why they're called unarmed combat. That's why it's called that. So, the... the the, the main point of the technique, the first and foremost, the technique is made to outmaneuver the opponent. That's why you're going to see in a lot of martial arts these te hand techniques that are very solid and they're fast and they're to the point. Block, 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 like Wing Chun, you know, Kung Fu, which where a, a lot of the Asian martial arts are derived from Kung Fu, okay? It's fast. It's direct. It allows for maneuverability. It allows for working the angles, Right? The main point of it is to get that strike in. And the strikes will set you up for another series of strikes. Just like in a sparring match, you know, when I throw a few blows, I, I probably don't intend to land those blows. Those are to set me up for the blow that I do intend to land. You have to understand this thing in its entirety before you speak on it. And if you do understand it, if your argument is that you do understand it and you're a shell, well, no, you don't understand it then because there's honor associated with it. You don't make nonsensical arguments to make yourself look good or because you're getting paid by the government or to make a sport look good. You're missing the whole point of martial arts. It is honor. Why fight in the first place? Before you even use the martial arts, you apply the honor code. Is this the right way and time to apply my martial arts wisdom and techniques? So before you even begin, initiate combat or respond or counterattack, you're referring to the honor code consciously or otherwise.